particular um, uh, weekend. So I'm going to go through uh, the individual speakers, ask if they would uh, make a, a short comment, any thoughts they have on this particular topic, and then we'll see if we get some session. Enhance trust and security in the ASEAN's digital economy. 
strengthen local digital economies and foster digital innovation within the ASEAN. Steve from uh, the Philippines is trying to be uh, a digital leader like that. I understand your point on expanding the connectivity. We do have a broad message around some of the developing countries here that we're not kind of aware of. Good Yes, uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, like the making a uh, digital community here in town in Tokyo. But mostly I'm personally working on the government sector, how we can use the digital technology. Uh, this is uh, really behind at this moment. Uh, we are associated in a traditional way with uh, people world or something. It takes a lot of time to integrate the company. Uh, however, it's been a very big gap between the people who use it and the people who develop it. What we have to do is to make it very easy to have a great consensus to make the directions uh, where we have to go. This is not just kind of the one simple issue. We have to make more and more communications. Uh, I'm personally working on this space to try to get a gauge to Asian market and try to make them new things. The community will be a new environment for additional implementation in the future. I want to take uh, an opportunity because we only have uh, three of our original speakers here. Uh, are there, is there anyone here who would care to volunteer to tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the digital space and what you think are some of the major challenges facing us? Do you have any volunteers? Anyone would like to? Please. Please tell us who you are, the company you're with, and then. I'm Rakesh, and uh, I'm from uh, Stockholm, India. Uh, so, one of the things that I feel when I do that uh, technology basis is the integration between like country countries, the transparency that can be offered in terms of uh, uh, like you know, uh, people and mind kind of human capital and being able to integrate that with other countries, like the ASEAN, for example, if we are able to work with multiple countries at the same time with the people and the resources that we are available, like that's available for us, it's really helpful. But you know, uh, each country is going to really offer that sort of a system that can really be able to work with. Right? So, there's one of the main challenges that I see that is in place, which kind of uh, slows down, uh, you know, great transparency, all of that for us to work. Thank you, Rakesh. Is there anyone else? While you're thinking about that, let me put my two weeks in work. I, I was planning to sit back with you folks and just listen, uh, but I, I, I run an IT company that uh, does professional services out of Hong Kong, we have offices in the Philippines and Singapore, we're expanding into the region, and it's um, where each touch is on, one of the key issues is, is, is the skills and the people are able to work together. Uh, I find one of the biggest challenges coming from what I would call the dominant culture in, uh, in the United States. Uh, the two dominant cultures are Indian, I think, and, and Western, Silicon Valley, Boston. By the way, I'm Canadian, I'm American. So, uh, those are the way I call the culture to run. And the other issue is, is, is connectivity. We've got about 60 people now in the Philippines that um, we're using to engage on our own projects as well as on certain clients, not globally. But it's, it's, it's finding a place with decent rent and decent, uh, decent infrastructure that um, is going to. I need to have the ability to uh, price below the global competitor in San Francisco or in Toronto. So those are two of my biggest issues. And the last one is, is constant. And uh, I, I hope I don't insult anybody. Uh, but I've been in this business in Asia for 24 years. And in general, I probably preach to the flyers and say, you're all in the digital space, you may actually agree with me But our industry leaders, our traditional industries still uh, are reluctant to engage IT as a strategic force, as, as an initiative to drive the business forward. 
It's changing a lot in the last couple of years, but it's been a slow, hard process. And, and especially where I'm from, where head office Hong Kong, I think we're one of the worst, uh, where we have all these riches, all these powerful companies, but not one CIO on a board of the company of substance. It's always a, a CFO and has an IT director, regardless of what his title is, the director that answers the, the CFO. So when you're a CFO looking at IT, you look at expense. That's it. No one has to teach it. And it's blocked us. It slows us down. There has to be a good engagement from the business community. Um, I'm hoping for a long now, but I would say after 24 years, just around the corner, there will be sunshine. And we'll, we'll all start spending the right amount of money. And that right amount of money may not be the same amount that they can spend with North America and Europe. <laughs>
too many digital companies are CFO-led, should be CIO-led, you suggested. I suggested they should be market-led. People who understand what the market needs rather than what digital can do. You raise a, a, a good point. I, I'm certainly going to have my blind spots in the IT company and climate to raise revenue. That's what I'm fighting all the time. But that goes back to Rakesh's comment, I think, um, about people. That this is a people industry. And you're seeing more and more now the studies that are coming out talking about the key skill sets going forward. Uh, and it's, it's not necessarily STEM, not engineering, not uh, data science, even. it's the people skills. I, I, if anyone wants to talk about this a little bit, I think that would be worth expanding on. Uh, I've not given it uh, as much thought as, as it deserves, but as I go my business out here, how do I get um, teams from India to work with teams in the Philippines to serve a client from uh, Toronto and, and, and get them all on the same page? Trying to meet the needs of a client who could be anywhere in the world. The further comment I would have is that it's culture as well. Therefore, when you think about the Philippines, you have to think about the Philippines. You don't necessarily think about India. If you think about India, you think about India. But cultures are the things which determine how we live. And one of the things that we have lost, which is why I'm here, is we've lost the identity of our, not only our culture, but communities. We've lost the identity of communities. We're building houses, we're not building communities. And this is, this is another subject, so I don't want to go into too much about it, but simply to say that digital needs to be in the space of culture as well as and communities. Does that mean, please? Yeah. Hi. It's because the FOs seem to be getting the flat here. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to also speak as a CFO. Sorry, please tell us who you are. Yes, Sorry. yes. I wanted to speak up as a CFO. I'm a CFO, my name is Keith, and I'm a CFO for IT at India. And um, on the one hand, I can be with you, and IT, by the way, does sit with me. But I think for any CFO who's um, uh, you know, at all involved in the business, we don't look at, you don't look at IT as a, uh, or technology as a cost. You, you know that businesses do not survive without technology, just as businesses do not survive without people or without customers. So it's pretty much going back and looking at, you know, what is it that the customer wants and, you know, uh, what is it that the people want um, and, and how does technology today actually completely enable that in a very different way to, you know, the way it was happening in the past. And I think that's, that, that is the way businesses are thinking. Can I clone you and put you in about 20 of my clients? So we're in agreement that we need to be more focused on the people and how they work together. We're in agreement that digital will be driving industry. What are some of the, um, the other roadblocks that we need to bring up? Uh, maybe I can share a bit of perspective from the Singapore context. I'm not sure how many of you actually know how Singapore works. Uh, for a few years now, the government has been very uh, focused and adamant about making Singapore a smart city. So from all kinds of angles, the government is looking at getting the citizens to be very digital savvy. So they provide things like grants um, and, and, uh, and monetary support for individual citizens to learn anything um, that's digital related. And uh, as well as uh, they provide grants to companies like um, those small medium enterprises um, to try to digital, digitize, digitize their uh, business operation as much as possible. And uh, I came from the background of uh, financial markets, and this industry is one of the high, most highly regulated industries and one of the last frontiers to go digital. And I could also see that uh, on this front, even the bank, the financial institutes are already trying their best to digitize. So I think, personally, I think it, it's a very top-down approach. Uh, governments would have to be really, really um, um, keen to digitize their economy uh, across the entire country before things will start trickle down from there. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will usually take a lot of, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, 
in the shows uh, for individuals or for those small companies or even the big MNCs uh, to digitize their operations uh, from that perspective. So, hello everyone. My name is Park from Vietnam. So, uh, I'm, I'm the CEO, co founder and CEO of Bingo. So, uh, a few months ago, I organized the APEC as an also a digital media. And uh, some information that uh, all of the session and region here is quite nice. But um, I, I want to turn to another edge is that um, how is the Cyber security in the digital world. Uh, some information that I, I, I collect from our event is that 68% of the SMEs under attack for the cyber security. So, whereas we are focused on business of people, we need to find a solution to repair in, uh, in digital uh, world. So, my question here is that besides giving the solution uh, in this digital world, how can we prevent the attack? Would they, would they want to carry on to that one? Uh, I, I'm happy to if one else wants to step up. If we have a cyber security unit in our business, and we're asked to solve the time. And there really are two aspects. That you need to break uh, the problem down uh, The first one is technical. Yeah. And that technical can include further security or it can include internal analysis of traffic. Yeah. If you're using um, tools, yeah. uh, that needs to get the investment. It's not trying to get the to spend um, more on technology. This is one of the examples I use. I've told all my clients for the last two years that uh, if you're spending X, in the first period in the budget last year, double it this year, and triple it this year. Because the threats are just coming uh, fast and heavy. The numbers are, are remarkable. This is turning into one of the world's largest industries. Uh, uh, fraud, uh, ransomware, and the like. But the other side that is starting to get uh, more uh, attention, and it was really to go to your point, was the people side. Once you've got your firewall in place, the CIA or the GHC, they're going to get the Russians, they're going to find a way to pass it. You know, it's not that. Um, but you're keeping the rip out of it. You've got a balance at the door. Um, internal traffic, you've got the tools in place, snippers in areas and, and the like. The will see stop. And you can, you can spend a ton of money on having companies just watch your traffic and tell you where there's problems. But then sometimes giving out free USB sticks at the local 7-Eleven uh, uh, outside your office, and there'll be somebody in your company that picks it up and drives it out of your system. So you really need to take a look at the people side of your, uh, your, your business. You need to train them, and that's not training once on security awareness and then go back once a year. It's always training, constant training, uh, exposing them to well, what, what we do with our clients is we're fishing on a regular basis. And then we're sending the results. Bob opened up another innovation. And luckily, it was one of ours this time. Uh, so, and I'm going to expect to see more and more on that. And that's not expensive. Uh, the, 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 the technology is way more expensive uh, way of doing this. But I, I, I went to my first um, potential client here in Vietnam uh, and asked them, What are you doing about cybersecurity? And, and I did not get a satisfactory response. We just don't have a problem. I don't understand how that's possible. They have 200 people, but I'm going to take those words down so I can figure out where it is. What was your answer? And if, and if you, you would say, like, a, we don't have any issue, we just simply ask them, like, in this group, for example, how many people in this group use the free Wi Fi for this advantage center? So if you use free Wi Fi and you don't have the anti virus, Somewhere you are under attack, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So your your company information can be leaked from here. Appreciate the I think if you use the browser either way, if somebody wants to attack you, they can attack no matter what. So it's it's like this: you're in a war 
also we have prepared all the time. But then irrespective of you being prepared about it, if somebody wants to really and get into your system, they can do it at any time by hand. So that's the challenge always with like so we, we we try to put all those barriers and bridges <coughs> forward. But if you know if you ask me is it hundred percent safe, it's never hundred percent safe. It's never hundred percent safe. I think there's also a very Darwinian approach towards um, cybersecurity. I mean, one can think of you know, um, viruses and you know, the way uh, people hack and, and, and attack people's uh, um, you know, data privacy as a continuously evolving process. Um, so every time you know, a new way um, to hack you know, the, somebody's uh, system comes up, you know, new forms of, of, of mechanisms and ways to prevent that from, from happening come up, but then it's, it, it's a continuous process, you know, that, that's, that moves, you know, just like, you know, the evolutionary process that we see in nature. Uh, the one smart for example, is just you know, from uh, Estonia. This is a digital facility in Korean. It's just kind of separated database. It's not just calling itself. Because it's just kind of like this conversion. Once the system is hot, but the other systems are working, this is the kind of separate process. Of this. The blockchain could be the work in the future. The system itself is now stored in a specific like the entities. This is gonna be a more secure if it works actually. But the technology itself is in the nascent. We have to see how we can make it something with good uh verifications between the government and how we can be with it. This is a good part of it. This combination could be working. Maybe it's a more secure environment is coming. <coughs> if I could just for a second, have there been any of our speakers that have come in that uh, didn't get introduced in the beginning? I just want to got a chance to review it. Okay. Not? Okay. I'd like to make a, a little bit of gear change and, and return to uh, data privacy uh, as an issue. Because uh, it's a personal issue, and I'm trying to figure out how to, to, to deal with this. Uh, we have clients in Europe, so we're, we're, we're trying to absorb GDPR issues uh, and the work that comes with them. We have SEC clients that have already driven us to a certain extent down that road. But now we've got uh, clients in the Philippines and the data privacy came in last May. And it's very onerous. It's, it's right up there with GDPR. I don't know how well it's going to be uh, uh, pleased. It's a, the rules are always tougher than the reality in the Philippines, but I don't want to be the test case. I'm curious if anyone here has experience with other regions on, on data privacy, on the attitude that governments and uh, clients and uh, people have in the area that they're from. Please. Uh, I think it's, you know, speaking in Indonesia at least, when we go into the digital economy, it's kind of like running a marathon before you can run a walk in terms of data privacy. Uh, I know one of the biggest issues in Indonesia is that the moment you apply for a credit card, your data, your national identity, your phone number, your email, all of that can be obtained when a working uh, person is at the bank and be sold to the companies and banks. So, and in our digital economy, it's you know, probably, it might have been more difficult, but it might you know, it could be the same, it could be perhaps easier. So, it's not until, at least for the regions of the state, uh, our situation, it's not until they provide some sort of rules towards that. Uh, that digital economy in terms of the uh, security, I think it's, it's not going to be that much of a difference. It'll be more of a point of view of protecting yourself from that kind of, right. I call it wild, wild west. Right, right, right. right. Like, how many times do you get a call in the middle of the day when you're meeting, you know, for someone you know, calling for a loan? You know? Thank you, appreciate it. Is there anyone from Vietnam that has any experience with being privacy? Vietnam, more like Indonesia in the early days, or more like in more Singapore, or um, Philippines? Anyone from Vietnam here?
early, would you dare say it's early days here? Uh, basically, I, uh, I, make, I, I focus mostly on the business side. So it's very hard for me to explain my perspective. That's why I keep silent when you say anyone from Vietnam here. Fair enough, fair enough. I don't want to get in trouble with, uh, with your wife or your boss. So. I wouldn't mind some feedback then uh, on this thought. Um, ten years ago, even if this is uh, as it was five years ago, I'm sure most everyone in this room that was involved in IT is looking at the internet, looking at this open source, open environment, and, and the, the, the more closed environment and trying to help so fall apart and uh, and wall end up being this one big cloud. And I would say that's not the case now. Say that the Chinese model is a very successful model in many, many ways, and it's starting to be exported. Maybe something that we see here in Vietnam, uh, early days on that. But we're, we're starting to see two visions of, of the IT, of the, of the digital world, uh, the connected digital world, uh, closed, private, uh, directed, and open, uh, free for all. Is this going to be the environment uh, going forward? Are we going to be two, three, or four? Or is the open uh, environment of the internet going to be enough to sway the post? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Please. Hi, my name is Tim Kobe. I'm from uh, California for the last 10 years. I've been in Singapore. Um, but I think it's interesting this discussion on privacy. Um, you know, maybe part of the problem is the way we tend to conversation. Um, we today are probably living in a post-privacy world where we all come from a, a world where previously privacy existed in some form or another. But maybe the conversation should be what happens when there's no such thing as privacy. And that's really the state of today. So rather than try to mitigate that that uh, edge, it's more important to start to think about the really a new world. I think you bring up uh, another issue, the generational issue. People of your and my age are more privacy oriented than with kids coming up today. And certainly, we're going to die out, but I'm going to be holding on to my privacy. My cold dead hands, they bury me in the ground. I've only got 20 or 30 years left on this planet, so. But it may be an illusion that it exists today. I mean, so you may be you know, holding on to the idea that the actual privacy I think is. So self examination is what you're advising. That's, that's, that's a pretty good advice. Statement on the open source versus a closed uh, uh, environment or technology. I think open source helps you accelerate the growth or accelerate the process of evolving the technology uh, for what you said. And when it's a closed network and if you're working on a closed environment, I think it does not give you that environment to, let's say, uh, <laughs> evolve or innovate or for everybody to do that, right? Like with an open source technology, what happens is uh, you have new technologies coming that is poked out of the you know older one fashion industry and you're able to evolve and you know, maybe secure yourself better with the new and upgrading one and upgrade yourself so that it, it helps you build solutions better or better solutions for larger scale. So I think open uh, you know you have to build an environment or technology open technology, open source technology primarily because of that the way the technology would evolve and accelerate much, much faster than it's that way. I don't, I'm not going to say you're wrong, but I could argue that. Let me do that just for fun. Um, the argument uh, going back to, there's a few gray hairs here that still remember uh, the VCR versus the beta mass. Um, you ever hear some of them? What's the fun? It's Samsung and Android is, is doing it particularly well on phones. Apple's the most valuable, well, it's still the most valuable one in the world, I don't know, I checked the stock exchange today. Maybe their, their, their time has come to take that to a closed environment. So I, I don't think the argument is settled yet. I, I think it's almost more philosophical, and I can tell just by the way you're sitting, slowly, your face turned open, you might look a little that way. Um, where some people want to do their thing in a closed environment, have their own innovation activity, where they can be protected. I'm just curious about what's going to drive, um, not necessarily to the world forward, but this part of the world forward. 
over the next five or ten years. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Henry Sternberg. I represent the Global Transformation Platform, and I have an unusual background, which is stands from um, in Ukraine, which is a former communist country, obviously part of Soviet Union, but I spent most of my life in the United States. What's interesting about this discussion, as you pointed out earlier, uh, that we have to separate two things. First of all, digital identity of an individual versus the corporate need to protect the know-how, the secret sauce. And I think there is a major opportunity here because for countries like Vietnam, for, uh, countries like Ukraine, <coughs> developing countries, uh, the individual security, individual privacy is the thing of the past. If the United States would have to go through the growth of e-commerce and all that stuff and protect privacy, in the countries where the digital economy is coming in a full force, there is no privacy. Think about the way you flew in here. Think about Black Friday. Everywhere we go, we must either face recognition, fingerprints now, or a credit card, or passport, or digital identity, or any kind. This data is somewhere. At some point, we see this in the movie, movies, futuristic movies, where everything's controlled by the product, right? So our lives, we have to accept that technology will not evolve that. And we have to constantly adapt, as we always, as humans, have to adapt it, to the new environment where there is no privacy besides your own bedroom and if you check for all the books, right? So therefore, we have to live our lives where transparency is part of that life. At the same time, we are allowing the government to take control completely over our lives, which is a very hard balance to find. But the argument versus cybersecurity, and I spent a lot of my time in cybersecurity space, especially in Ukraine, after no paid cyber, after no paid cyber, after, no after critical infrastructure of the country. Those were scary times for many Ukrainians where you can literally shut down the city by getting bought into the electrical system. So therefore, there is a very great, that very, very limited balance that can be found, in my opinion. But the, it has to be separate between the person and entity, be it government entity or corporate entity. And it has to be a very strict law as to how much government can interfere into your life. And that's just my opinion. We do respect that China become the great United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, um, I'm Terry Kennedy from Asia Media Partners. We run the website Vietnam Business TV. And I just point out that in the area of the Mekong, what we're basically for the first five countries of Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, the first state is actually linking them into the Asia Pacific Smart Cities Network, which is 26 key cities which are coming together. From there, and that covers five of the ASEAN countries. So when you actually look at privacy, or any concept related to privacy, the real issue right now is that there's going to be three or four models. There's the EU model, there's the US model, there's the China model. The, the, the question is, what model is ASEAN going to pick? Okay. In 2020, there's an integration by December 31st, in theory, of at least 16 areas of business for the 10 ASEAN countries. And I think the question is, which country right now is going to lead that model? So we look at Bitcoin, we look at certain things related to cyber, where is Singapore on those, then who is Vietnam following? Who is Cambodia following? Who is Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, etc.? And that's the real question in terms of the Mekong region or the ASEAN Pacific region. Which model are which countries going to lead with? You know, Singapore says we're kind of like the most technologically advanced, but the other countries will say, but you're only 7 million people. Vietnam says, we're 93 million people. We should leave. Myanmar has a different idea. Thailand has a different idea. And that's the first point is even in the ASEAN region is trying to create a consensus as to what is data, what is privacy, everything from there. Thank you. Excellent observation. Please. My name is Eddie Chama.
the first, I want to respond to uh, the open source. Uh, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, that's our central bank, and they just been encouraging uh, companies. Uh, they know that you know, they, they may have their own system, especially the bank. They don't want to share the same. And also know that you know, the, the, the digital economy is pushing to a lot of limits. Like, I think you look at uh, the social network, uh, people who share information openly. So that is a poor, very polarized you know, systems and approach. So what they're going to do actually is they want to kind of sort it. It's called API economy, meaning that you know, the, the application program is that is, I don't care about what you do, as so long as you make sure that the API is available. Whether you're a closed system, open system, or proprietary system, and all that. So uh, that is a, uh, already in the last 24 months, there's a lot of and I also see in other countries what you get is pushing a lot of API. Banks actually, this last time, they never, never opened up their community. And now they open up. So that's why there's a lot of new applications come out from the, from the, from the, from the, from the, the few of the digital economies, or payment uh, system coming out, Bitcoin, or you know, sort of blockchain applications, and all that. It's a little bit, bit right now. So that, that is Singapore's approach, this API economy we talk about. The second one is, um, uh, just now the gentleman is talking about the digital identity. I, I fully agree that, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, at least we can share, I can share, you know, about the Singapore approach is about the root of trust. Uh, the trust factor, because if, if, if people are willing to sort of uh, share with you their digital information and all that, there must be a trust factor there. So in fact, in Singapore, you know, in the last two years, uh, it started to uh, start up a, uh, this uh, Singapore, what we call the Smart Nation Project. And this Smart Nation Project is one of the key products, or you know, this foundation before it is a national digital ID, an NDI, national digital identity. So that, that probably would be able to, to help to slay the foundation. So with that, then you know a lot of other commercial application, government application would be able, based on that to exchange information because there's a huge trust factor there. Now, how are we going to extend it to other countries and all that? That's a big question, I have to be honest. So we have to start somewhere, I guess. It's the uh, ASEAN issue on a very specific one. Uh, actually, in the, uh, in the last uh, this year, is, uh, Singapore actually chaired the ASEAN. And in fact, uh, the e ASEAN and also you know, the digital <coughs> ASEAN, it is right in the top of the agenda right now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vigo Sikki Maladana from Laos. Um, I'm a citizen in the construction and in the um, I just want to add uh, around the uh, privacy I sort of uh, given up my privacy about 10 years ago when I joined the Facebook. And uh, since then, there's no privacy for me. Um, and I agree with a lot of um, other people talking about you know, uh, protecting privacy. I think, um, to me, and it's, it's more a uh, question rather than comment. I think uh, trying to protect privacy uh, is good, but I, I don't think that uh, our data or Privacy, um, you know, is uh, not is, is any longer uh, something private. Um, what I'm concerned more is around the impact of losing privacy, and I think this is uh, an issue of you know things that we don't really understand around you know using artificial intelligence, using other uh, you know big data technology to uh, to try to manipulate uh, us in a way. Don't really have control. You know, uh, people can use, uh, uh, for example, in, in terms of Facebook, um, a lot of data to manipulate markets. Uh, you know, to, to actually change the way you buy things. You don't even know. Uh, you know, like people are saying that Facebook knows about you more than you do about yourself. Um, but that's that's not just Facebook, obviously. Um, I'm just interested in uh, yeah, uh, some of the views around how do we go about 
um, you know, making sure that people get some awareness about what um, you know, technology and a digital transformation can do in terms of life changing, in terms of market um, influence. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I just want to go back to the gentleman of um, uh, the issue of um, establishing a national identity within within the ASEAN region. And I think there are several road, roadblocks that basically um, prevent us from, you know, uh, establishing that national identity. And, and there are four. Uh, one, I think, is trust. Uh, so the ASEAN basically has um, very low trust uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of providing their their information on a digital platform. Um, there's statistics that support that. And I think um, one way to basically so one way to basically address that um, would, would be to have some sort of a, a unified uh, privacy act within the ASEAN region. Um, another roadblock would be a unified and harmonized system within the ASEAN. Um, I think one way to basically address uh, that roadblock as well would be to have a national ID system that basically interoperates um, with, with each other. Um, so while each country can have its own um, national ID system, um, there has to be some, some way to basically allow these national IDs to basically interoperate with each other. Um, the third roadblock right, would be um, a board to basically ensure the execution of a harmonized um, policy and regulatory framework to foster um, you know, having a national digital identity. So um, uh, um, in, in, in the EU, for instance, I think uh, it, they basically demonstrated it great model and um, in fact they've gone so far as to establish an index which basically summarizes all of the metrics that are used to measure the extent to which um, you know digital strategies are basically uh, making an impact on and, and basically the effectiveness of, of its execution and so if the ASEAN can have one of those as well to basically continuously track and measure the progress of establishing the aforementioned digital identity, um, those those things would, would greatly benefit the ASEAN region and its digital integration. So I think it's uh, one of the interesting things is we talk about digital and we talk about data. It seems like it's something new. It seems like it's something that's come along from Facebook and so on like that. But I would go back and I would say, what's the number one characteristic that everyone probably in this room has that is a digital platform that they've been carrying for 20 plus years, 30 years. It's called a credit card. Okay. Do you not think all of your data is already centralized into certain platforms? Okay. How much data does American Express, MasterCard, HSBC have on you? Standard Charter, you know where you shopped? They know what you shopped for, and that's all before Facebook. So we're kind of like focusing in one way on digital without saying what is the definition of digital first. Okay. And actually, you know, the, the, the more, again, the pressure within ASEAN is Vietnam as a certain form of government, Cambodia is a certain form of government, versus or in conjunction or differentiated from Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, like that. So again, I would say that you know, uh, uh, national digital IDs are something that's going to happen in certain ways, but you know, they're already there in other ways, like that. So you know, the banks have been there. When you ordered from Lazada or Alibaba or whoever on 11.11, okay, they were storing your data, they were keeping your data. Okay, and that wasn't from Alipay. Alipay came from where? Credit cards, bank debit cards, bank statements already. It's just a different part of the platform. But the data-based platform has been there for 50, 60, 75 years. You had TRW and Equinox in the US doing all of the bank, all of the credit cards within just two silos back in the 1970s. It's just expanded from there. The point now is that almost any company through its own data system can replicate and gather all of that data if they want to.
um, point, point is very well received. Um, I, I just think that you know there's just one very important uh, distinguishing factor between um, you know both um, both eras, and I think the advent of the internet has really changed the way you know digital would be defined. No disagreement. Who are you talking? Uh, I guess the uh, like data owners is the need to be changed from authority to the individual in the future. This is a key part of the concept. Uh, the blockchain itself is maybe not a central technology, but from the internet perspective, which is a hub from the individual environment, which is a key part of it. But like much of the problem is coming, like a Facebook, Google, uh, or other internet players gain a lot of the profit. It's kind of information symmetric at this moment. What we have to do is to bring back to authority to go back to the individual level, but we have to see uh, some tenors to see the individual data security, this is a key part of it. I guess the government, how they can make it secure uh, circumstances for individuals can access to the data privacy, this is a very big important part. In Japan, we started the digital identity numbers, so far the first goal was uh, 80, 80 million people distributed these numbers, but still just uh, 40 million. It's been a very missing opportunity. What they are doing is to try to expand the, uh, like the chances to use this digital identity the system. But right now, we need to make a duplicate submission. So once you uh, provide your driver license, you have to go to the same digital entity. This is so meaningful. What we need to do is make more uh, convenient infrastructure to use the digital entity. This is a key part of it uh, in order to make expanded digital economy in the future. We have to see how we can bring back to this digital story to the individual and how we can make more secure infrastructure. This is a very key part of it, and like the goal of the communication. Yeah, just one thing. There's some of the gentlemen there you know, mentioned about you know, credit card uh, have a lot of our information. It is true, you know. And uh, even though our hospital records actually have everything, including our blood type, you know, all of them, everything is in the hospital. Now, uh, and now, uh, why all of a sudden, you know, it's a big fuss about that, you know, updated, they need to change or maybe share, you know, open it. I think the major difference is because the uh, those banks, hospitals, in most of the country are regulated. They, they are regulated means they have a very strict framework for sort of regulation we share and share. So, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, the privacy law probably is one of the most stringent right now. They even have, uh, have one actually the right to be forgotten. It means if I press a button, everything just disappears. So they want to force, you know, uh, the open world that is like Google, the Facebook, and all that. You know, I want to be forgotten. So I don't want to appear in Facebook. I don't want to be appear in Google anymore. I mean, I have a back record. But that is extremely difficult actually in the open world to make it happen. So I think the digital economy it is like versus the regulated economy. That is something that I would say that you know, it is a challenging. It will, it will continue to happen in the next many years to come. But that is something that I would say that, you know, it's, uh, uh, if you look at Singapore, actually is trying to sort of uh, 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 converge these two, and try to make sense between the, the, the two different kind of economy. Uh, they don't want to sandbox it, per se, because it's extremely difficult to ring fence. Uh, but one thing actually is, let's work together in certain projects. Uh, instead of like, okay, this is a regulated industry that is an open economy, I don't want to talk to each other. So, uh, I believe that, you know, at the end of the day, the uh, uh, certain organization, for example, in ASEAN, you know, uh, take ASEAN example, they have to work out something, how are you going to manage, I would say, I don't like to use the word regulate, right? The, the open world, the open economy, the digital economy. I think how you have to look at it is, in the old days, all data was held separately. You said it correctly, it's all connected now. And the real issue is what can I opt out of easily? It's not that I want to opt out necessarily, or I think people in the EU want to opt out of everything 
I still want my browser to keep all of my favorite adult video sites or my, you know, whatever it is I like, my sports, whatever, my news sites. I don't want to opt out of everything. But in the old days, everything was separate servers, separate systems. Now it's all connected. The question is how much in a connected economy, a connected network world, do we really want to connect into it? And how can we limit the connections? You know, people say, oh, you know, my phone goes off in the middle of the night. Fine, turn it off. Oh, I don't like what my children are watching on TV. Fine, change the channel. You know, I don't like what my kids are watching on the internet. Turn off the computer. It's not that difficult to start disconnecting if that's what we want to do, or connect more if that's also what we want to do. So under the conversation. Hi, I'm um, Mr. John. Uh, my name is Sam from a venture capitalist. So I, my job, hopefully, is to create a future, uh, be able project where the world is going and the best five to ten years ahead of the curve. So from my perspective, uh, I'm a mean, global venture uh, you know, from the deals around the globe. Uh, let me create a framework for you guys to think about. I know that in the last half an hour, the debate has been quite extreme. One is really total privacy, and the other is really total open uh, data platform. I think that the result will be something in between for a couple of reasons. One is, at the end of the day, uh, the way the blockchain is designed, is what vision to be, is really a way individuals can control their own destiny, have their own pocket, uh, envelope, contain information, and release what you want to the world based on what you want to release. Now, whether they come with a Chinese version versus the rest of the world version to be determined because everyone has a different incentive to create a version of it. But the framework is as such. Um, I have seen companies that have been invested to create that framework. Essentially, we create a whole internet from scratch, a new generation called blockchain based platform. They have a control of the destiny. Now, as individuals, actually, there's a couple of reasons why you want to expose yourself to the world. Uh, one is for convenience. Uh, for example, in medical emergencies, if you want someone to get medical data, you don't have time to release your data when the emergency happens. So we want to program that information is being sent to your medical service providers automatically when it happens, so they can be treated quickly. They're for a part of business school that's been funded to do that. So the link to the police system, medical record, the police, and the emergency happen. It's also convenience. In China, people are open to share their Alibaba and WeChat, WeChat data because they want to basically do this the purchase in five seconds instead of hours. So we're able to share because of the reason. And another reason why we want to be able to share is because the see you feed environment is happening. Let me, let me define what that means. CDB meaning you control the data, you want to release what you want to release to. In, in some cases, you're being rewarded now for doing that. So you get paid for it, you get a discount of what you get a purchase, you get to release your data to the uh, suppliers. They can unlock the data and be able to deliver to you talk to your likeness. And for what you get paid for, the discount or the rewards, I think for those two reasons, I think the reward has been the framework for data sharing. So I, I would propose that if you think about data security and I say going forward, you have to think about somewhere in, in between. There are reasons why data share or reasons to control. And blockchain by design is to create that kind Please. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, uh, I want to add to what Stan had said, and uh, I want to share two personal stories. One of them is my daughter, who is 70 years old, who actually went to a trip to Ecuador. And when she got back, um, she goes, then it was the most amazing experience not to have my phone with me. And it was I just, so the teenagers started being overwhelmed and moving away from being constantly attached to the phone or to the media. The second story, recently, about two weeks ago, my Amazon account got hacked. And all my book notes, the remarks, and everything else were completely lost. Um, and what's interesting about both of those stories are how conflicted they are, in a way. On one hand, we really need this, on the other hand, we really want to get away from it. Even the younger generation is already looking, as you mentioned earlier, a different generation who remember 
you know, VHS and all that stuff, right? But the younger generation who grew up with technology is now looking to get away from it. But at the same time, we must realize the trends that we have today are irreversible. Digitization is happening. It will not stop. The more interesting when we're discussing in terms of Asia, a separate uh, different laws and rules, I think we should look at the digitization of the economy as an opportunity to bring the globe together on the once, for the first time maybe, historically, the rules that govern all in terms of the internet because it is global, isn't it? And yes, there's always a lot of conflicts to discuss, but it has to be somewhere in the conversation a switch where somebody can shut it off and be away from it all. And just to, you know, go and, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe meditate, you know, away from the phone. Idea is that we cannot start talking about how to put new blocks of how to protect your data and all that. It's very important. But for every, think about banks, right? From the time the banks were actually formed, people were robbing the banks. To this day, people are still robbing the banks. Think about digital currency that's coming right now. People steal digital currency. There's always going to be bad characters, and every time we invent a new lock, we are creating new opportunity for somebody to hack it. I was, uh, a long time ago, I was in New, new Hampshire, Mass, uh, United States, school sent home. Many presidents of the United States and many big officials went to that. We were shocking about this when I walked into the dorm, there was no locks. And I asked the re attendant, why there's no locks in the school anywhere, including his office and all He goes, because if you are closing the door on your lock, you have something to hide. That was his answer, I remember, 20 plus years ago. So we have to embrace it. There's no other way. And I think it's a kind of thing opportunity to bring everybody together on a global basis, not just regional or country basis. Thank you. Thank you. Just one story. I'm the former CEO of the French Railways in Europe. And we introduced the digital ticket for claims six years ago. And there was an interesting thing about what we're saying about the fact, about the fact that um, threats should not reframe the digital economy. Prior to the e-tickets, train tickets were anonymous. No names, nothing. Now, they are not anonymous anymore. So there is somewhere some database that can keep track of your journeys in Europe. With your name, your hour, date, or so on. What is the effect of this? Nothing. Nothing because there is rules in the EU which are not perfect. But there is rules that forbid anyone to use this database on two conditions. Three conditions. If you are not okay with that, if it is against you, or if it is for commercial purpose. So privacy is not an issue anymore. It's not an issue. First of all, you are not forced to give your name. You are not forced to put something about yourself in the database, whoever is the owner of that database. If there is no rule forbidding Facebook or whoever, to use your private pictures against you, then for sure it's a huge threat. So don't put any picture. If you don't want to have track of your journey in Europe, don't use planes, don't use trains. And the last thing you can say is that we always speak about threats in digital economy. Perhaps we could speak more about opportunities on what is going to happen really in Asia with the fact that no borders mean no doesn't mean no rules, okay, but more opportunities for countries who doesn't have infrastructures, more opportunities for countries who can provide a huge number of skills. I'm now living in Vietnam for one year. I can tell you that the number of skillful engineers in Vietnam is the most important asset that this country can have, really. So threats, okay, privacy, okay, cybersecurity is another thing. Um, one of our friends talked about awareness. I would prefer to talk about education. Same thing, if you have an app on your mobile phone or your iPhone, 
that allows you to make fun transfers. Be aware of the fact that it's an important thing. You don't leave the keys on your car. So education will prevent you from more, most of the problems that you can have with digital economy. But let's focus more on the opportunity. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Peter Toshi Chema. I'm a CEO of Money Income in Japan. Um, uh, I have been uh, involved in the uh, digital marketing industry for the past 20 years, and in my experience, uh, I completely agree with the gentleman over there. Um, we cannot swim against the big wave. Uh, the, the big data, the data, data connecting other data, is a big wave. So we cannot avoid um, connecting data with other data. So, um, so in, in, my, in my opinion, the question is, no, the issue is, uh, how, issue is not how to avoid the connecting other data. The issue is how to, uh, which can be regulated and which cannot be regulated. Because uh, in, the US, in, the, in Europe, the GDPR has been in effect in this year. And a lot of companies have, have been investing a lot of money in this year to comply with the GDPR. That can be regulated. So, so the question is, how to, um, which is regulated and which is not regulated? That's my issue. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I guess that, like, taking a bar and is a big part of it. Uh, what the limitation of the regulation is. So, uh, in Europe, I had a talk with some um, the blockchain space people who said just they try to work in a parallel uh, to put a specific rule, uh, GDPR, beside the working on the technology development. This is very important to combine technology and regulation because the security is not perfect every time. We try to make uh, everything 100% digital to part of it. The regulatory parties try to pave the way for public voice or something. But the technology part, they try to involve the developers who can create something a new uh, prevention. This is the key part of it. Uh, Japan is also trying to make a company like right? uh, in the crypto market, they try to put a specific license for the exchange. Besides, they try to make a uh, new way to uh, like the environment for engineers coming to there and having the scrutiny how it works in the crypto market. This is the company. We have to take the balances in uh, like the new challenge in this city of uh, This is my question. Uh, this is my answer to your questions. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're running close to the end. Uh, what I would like to do is just wrap things up a little bit. I've given Ira uh, one minute heads up, and I'll give you guys a heads up. I would like, Ira, if you want to summarize what you've heard, your thoughts, or if you have one key point that you want to make. Okay, I have a question for everyone who's just curious, and I believe that everyone is very curious as well. How many of you, personally, as an individual, think that GDPR is something very important for you, as an individual? Those who raise your hand, can you explain why? Why is GDPR so important to you that, that having it, what does it affect you, and how does it really affect your life in any way if GDPR is not around? How does it negatively affect your life? For those who raise their hand, maybe would you like to share? Because I think bottom line is we need to understand what is the motivation of having a certain regulation or a certain way of protecting. Because how many of you are parents here, by the way? Because I've always been thinking about, I have a high school son. To what extent should I go and protect my children? Is it more important for me to educate them what to look out for and what to be careful about? Or should we think about how can I get the government, the police to enforce such a way that strangers, you are not allowed to speak to my son. You are not allowed to get any information from my son. This is basically like what the government or the political parties are trying to do by having this kind of thing. Ultimately, the more you try to protect your citizens, your people, or your child, the more reliant they are on you. And I have seen, I mean, I've been in the financial industry for so many years. And I've seen bubbles happening, subprime crisis. It all evolves from the same rationale. And after a subprime crisis, government starts to regulate it, it creates more friction, more regulatory costs.
And then what happens? People who want to take advantage of ignorant people will always be able to find ways, another way to go around. So I don't think there's an end to protecting privacy. And I'm sure many of you have heard of this term before. If you are not paying for a product, you are basically the product itself. And I think that's a very fair thing to do because how many of you have actually contributed your email to receive something free in return? Anyone? Right, so we all understand, we all understand that, that, that part of the game. So the important thing, like what this element has said, the important thing is if someone has got your information, is that somebody using your information to do something bad against you, or is that person using your information to add possibility to add better things to your life? And I think that is the most important thing. And by having if we keep thinking about trying to protect this privacy, protect that privacy, it's going to just increase friction for the end user, as well as increase regulatory compliance and all these friction costs to businesses as well. And I don't think in the long run it's going to be benefiting to, to, to anyone. So obviously this is not something that on individual level or at business uh, business individuals level we can do because this was all top down from the government. But I think that would be something that if all of us can bring back and get the point across and think about why is data privacy, what does the motivation behind data privacy is trying to protect us against. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is a good summary of one of the key issues that we've obviously talked about here. Adam? Um, and um, another theme that uh, this panel discussion basically revolved around today was um, how do we embrace the digital revolution? Um, just as we have, we've had the, indus the industrial revolution in the 19th century, which basically had a pro very profound impact on all of humanity, um, we are basically approaching a stage where digital is basically going to have an analogous effect in this day and age. So how do we embrace the digital, the, the digital economy? Now, the only certainty is uncertainty, change. Now, let's prepare for it and harness it. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so uh, I think that the digital empowerment is an achievement and we will move to our running. There is a, many people is coming today and people is just uh, try to rally each other. This is a very good opportunity for all of us because we have a like coming from the different countries, a different space. It's a time we have to think about how we can create something, not just a simple issue, just kind of mark of communication, this is a key part of digital economy and parliament, I believe. So I'm very happy to be having a great conversation with you this morning. Well, let me um, try to summarize if I could. Two questions were often raised in the uh, terms of the first question, and other than I was talking about it now, we didn't talk about it, and I know why, because we're doing it. We're there. We're, we're convinced the world is going to be to something more important, and that's actually what I would expect from a comment like this. The next one was how do we change this instrument, a widespread open navigation of digitized uh, communication economies? And we talked to several points there. Um, the, the point of sorry, this one, uh, regulation is all the most, uh, a big theme, and you were hearing it in various different points around um, cooperation definitions of privacy and what isn't private, uh, and the need for investments, both uh, uh, private investments and public investments, and the need for education, the need to focus on improving the right set of skills. And te technology itself, technology of, of blockchain, may be uh, one of the, the, the key uh, pieces, uh, tools in our set to be able to allow us to live in a digital world where we decide um, what's private and what is private. But that the people side of it is, is going to be driving, not just the technology, it's how we work together, it's whether we cooperate or not cooperate. And the last key point, something that we can walk away from this movement and be proselytizers for, is looking at our own behavior. Do you turn it off or do you turn it on? Do you engage or do you don't engage? Do you choose to, uh, to use certain tools and not use other tools? And, um, I, I, I like to a point of uh, taking some personal responsibility because I, I think that's part of the issue that we're all dealing with now, especially uh, of our generation, my generation, the older generation, is we're not using this, so we've never had to think about this, but we need to take personal responsibility. 
and uh, a lesson I've been trying to impart on people for 30 or 40 years. I was using email in 1982, back when I was at university, and I worked for Shell, a tough corporation, emails. And this, if you type it, you, you want to make sure it's okay for your mom to see it. Because sooner or later, your mom's going to see it. So pick and choose, a little personal behavior here. Maybe you want to have that conversation face to face as opposed to type it up. I think we were talking about Dolce Gabbana. I was a uh, secular couple who had been taking that lesson this last week. And so to end it all, um, I very much like your point, sir. Um, the world is filled with threats. All the best movies, all the best TV shows, are all thoughts about the world coming to an end, and AI is going to put us all up the street. It's all terrible from here. And, and that's just not true. We're, we're part of the upper march of humanity right now. In my lifetime, it has never been better, and it's continuing to get better. Sure, there's problems, but we need to focus on the opportunities. We need to focus on what's going to make a better world for us, and hopefully a more profitable world for our businesses, and uh, a wider world for our children to play. So thank you very much for your cooperation, and uh, I look forward to talking to each and every one of you.